Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein overnight defending himself and his handling of the Mueller probe, really while taking on his critics. I did pledge to do it right and to take it to the appropriate conclusion. I did not promise to report all results to the public because as my fellow U.S. attorneys know well, grand jury investigations are ex parte proceedings. It's not our job to render conclusive factual findings. We just decide whether it's appropriate to file criminal charges. John Avalon is back with us. Also joining us now, Elena Plott, CNN political analyst and White House correspondent for The Atlantic, and Frank Bruni, CNN contributor and New York Times op-ed columnist. And, and Frank, this speech that Rod Rosenstein gave overnight to the Armenian Bar Association was... <laughs> as one does. As one does. does. <laughs> was fascinating uh, because he seemed to be taking on critics from all sides, defending his role in all of this thing. I'm the one who did it all right. Um, Look, he was critical of the Obama administration for not taking Russia more seriously. Yeah. He was critical of people like Donald Trump inadvertently for not not directly right. for saying that the investigation, the independent counsel investigation should have happened. Uh, but one of the things that jumped out to me was how serious he said the Russian attacks were. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and he said we haven't even heard all of it in the Mueller report. But that is a part of the Mueller report that I fear has been obscured by all of our all of our looking at how Trump behaved and did he obstruct mm -hmm. justice, did mm -hmm. he attempt whatever. Um, Beyond all of that, what Donald Trump hasn't done as president is address this interference mm -hmm. and take steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. Because as we know, he can't do that without feeling like the legitimacy of his election has been questioned. Going forward, long term, that's a really, really serious thing. And I think years from now, when we look back at this episode, when we look back at the Mueller report, which went into this in great detail, I think we're going to be talking as much about the absolute complacency you know, the cavalierness about what happened in 2016 and how to protect the American democratic system. But I mean, his administration says about. he's doing it. So he, he no. is not personally doing it. But the people around him say that Al they're taking Allison, steps. Allison, do you believe for a nanosecond that when the person at the top is not enthusiastically urging that, yeah. and in fact won't even talk about it, that the people below him can do it. Well, I mean, we've do. asked this question a million times, and, and for instance, Secretary Nielsen, uh, Kirsten Nielsen, right. said that she had to convene her own meetings with other intel agencies. So they're trying. It would help if the person at the top were on board. But do I think DN the DNI is Dan Coats is doing it? Yeah, I mean, I think they're trying to I think do. He's things. doing it as best he can without the proper backing and support. Yeah, the story of this administration is an effort to contain the president and and. and and carry on the business of government outside the president's worst instincts. The problem is we know, you know, that, that Donald Trump doesn't want to deal with Russian interference. And that will be one of the things that is, is the probably most damning in the eyes of history because it's an area where he could unite the nation. But instead, people in his administration try to go around the president and the White House, because as we saw Jared Kushner, the same issue. This is just really a, an irritation. Uh, and the Mueller report, even the stuff we've seen, is a damning indictment of how extensive, much more extensive, and much more pro-Trump and anti-Hillary than in previous been reported. And the deputy attorney general is saying as extensive as those details are in the Mueller report, There's he's more. saying that only scratched the surface. Yes. You know, it's the sources and methods. John Avalon just gave us a really good segue into Elena <laughs> Plot here when John said the story of this administration has been trying to contain the president. Well, maybe the story up until this point, because there's a new sheriff in town when it comes to being chief of staff, right. and that's at, well, I should say acting sheriff, Elena, sorry, a <laughs> acting sheriff Mick Mulvaney, who's the chief of staff. And you've got a really interesting article with big fat quotes from Mick Mulvaney on how he sees his job as chief of staff. And, and man, I have to say, it's, it's a lot different. He, you know, he said, often Mulvaney said the president is not telling Ace to do something illegal. He's just giving me ideas on what his priorities are and what he wants to accomplish. That's how he's explaining why he's letting Trump be Trump. I remember when he told me that and I thought, okay, so just sometimes illegal requests, just, you know, a sliver of the time out of all of our days in the White House. But no, I mean, you're absolutely right. And Mick Mulvaney was quite candid with me in his um, trashing of John Kelly. Yeah. What he said was General Kelly's institution of a place in which morale was quite low in the White House. He said, now senior staff meetings are more of a free for all. White House official told me that they're hanging from the rafters now in Mick Mulvaney's um, office. Um, it, it's kind of more closely resembling what Wright's previous um, time in the White House looked like, a lot more freewheeling. Wheeling. Mick Mulvaney said that he doesn't want information to be a currency in this White House. But above all, what I think is so important to communicate to viewers of this segment is that Mick Mulvaney is a really ambitious guy. I mean, he's had essentially three titles in this administration thus far, and sources say that he's already looking on to see at what point he could maybe succeed Wilbur Ross as Commerce Secretary. One um, senior House GOP aide told me that he is a master of self 
self-preservation. <laughs> so when he says that he would like to help Trump be Trump and just sort of give him the tools he needs to be the kind of president he wants to be and lead the way he wants to, that's Mick Mulvaney looking out for number one, not sure. necessarily the president. Sure. No, I, look, it, it, it's a great profile on it, and everyone should read it. Um, but Mulvaney, Mulvaney is is a master of self-preservation at the expense of anything resembling principle. <laughs> and only in the Trump administration would, would a stint as Commerce Secretary be seen as a step up in terms of peace of mind and career trajectory from the chief of staff in the White House. The problem, of course, is that we know from the Mueller report that basically Donald Trump's bacon was saved by aides who tried to contain his exactly. worst instincts and not execute them. So when you have someone who says, my survival game is going to be based on being the biggest sycophant possible in this position, that actually doesn't help the president or the administration or the country. A couple quotes that I want to read from Alana's great piece. So this is, he is not mincing words about his predecessor, John Kelly. I mean, he goes no. out of his way, Alana, it sounds, to criticize him. So here's just one. Um, it was an experiment gone bad, he says. I think, uh, I just think it's very hard to cultivate a healthy work environment when somebody near the top lets everybody know that they hate their job. So, Frank, the experiment gone bad is, was, I guess, trying to exert some control in the traffic of the White House. One more thing, uh, because I know your love of food that I share. Oh, thank you. This is the physical effect that the job has oh. had on <laughs> Mick Mulvaney. Yeah. Um, he cheerfully extolled his relationship with Trump, joking that he's gained 10 pounds since becoming chief. I eat more with the president now, he said. He eats hamburgers all the time. Oh, yes, this is also the president who greets people with vast volumes of fast food spread out, right? But I, I just, it is, by the way, it is a great, congratulations to Elaine, it's a great profile. Um, the Thanks, idea man. of the White House as a place of high morale, um, that to me doesn't pass the smell test or even begin to. Come on. I mean, the vast and bruised Trump administration diaspora attests to what it's like to work in this administration. You know, let's ask Kirsten Nielsen. Let's ask uh, Rex Tillerson. Um, for that matter, let's ask John Kelly. You know, that's a, one of the great lines was when Mulvaney said, look, any of us could be fired at any time. <laughs> You know, it's like, we got no job security here, and it's totally capricious. So I'm just going to go on and hope I can become the next conversation. If his desire is to get more power, as John says, yeah. he wants to do it one hamburger at a time, eating your way <laughs> That's right. into the cabinet. Eat yourself fitter. But, but, Elena, what about Allison's point here and John's point, Frank's point here, which is that if, when you read the Mueller report, you take away that it was only the presence of people saying mm -hmm. either no to the president, not directly, but not carrying out his actions, if those people are gone in that attitude is gone, is the president, is the country in some kind of new jeopardy? I do think you have to consider the implications of this notion that when it comes to Trump's guardrails, I mean, they are gone. I think, um, you know, one way I thought of Mick Mulvaney as I interviewed him was in many ways as the anti-Don McGahn. I mean, think about it this way. Um, were Mick Mulvaney holding Don McGahn's position, which theoretically he could because he does have a JD, and Donald Trump had called him and said, I want you to fire Robert Mueller immediately, I'm not sure that Mick Mulvaney would even blanch at that thought. I, no. I think he would immediately pick up the phone and give the orders needed to make sure that Mueller was swiftly gone. I don't think you would see some, um, something like Don McGahn slow walking the president's orders and assuming that he just won't bring it up at some point in the near future. <laughs> All right. And then you have obstruction. No, just because <laughs> the, the idea that letting Trump be Trump is a good thing. Letting Trump be Trump is letting a despot bloom, right? That's what it is. On that note, <laughs> Frank, <laughs> Elena, John, thank you. Have a great All. Friday, everyone. Thanks for the perspective.